Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dylan. If you have your Bibles, open the book of 1 John, if you would, please. 1 John chapter number 5. So we continue in our series, the book of 1 John, coming to the end of 1 John. Real, real close now. You look there and say, wow, Pastor Howell, we can see the end of the book. Don't worry, there's plenty left. All right, 1 John, what a tremendous book. John, as he writes uh, to us and uh, to uh, the believers throughout the time, through the, of course, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brings a number of pertinent topics and pertinent ideas. And tonight he brings one that I believe will be a help and a blessing because it's something that we sometimes will struggle with. It's also one of the points, all right, one of the emphasis of the book of 1 John. In the book of 1 John, there's some different, uh, some different ideas that would be some bold ideas. All right, one we'll look at tonight is Jesus Christ came in the flesh and dwelt among us. Second thought is that God is love. You can't read John and know the gospel of John, for God so loved the world. In the book of First John, God is love. We love him because he first loved us. And not take away the idea that our God is a loving God. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. All right, don't let your mind tell you otherwise. Well, I don't feel like God loves me because my life isn't going like I think it is. No, God loves you. That's what the Bible says. You can bank on it. You can count on it. You can uh, do whatever you want to on it. God is love, and we love him only because he loved us first. We come to, book of, uh, to the end of chapter number 5 of 1 John, looking in verse 6, if you would, please. The Bible says, This is he, speaking of Jesus Christ, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Let me pause here real quick. There are some Bibles out there who will not have that verse in them. You know, let me repeat that. There are some Bibles. They call them Bibles. And 1 John 5, verse 7 is not in there. Or if it is in there, it's in the notes at the bottom. There's a little note at the end that says, well, in the oldest manuscripts, you will not find this verse. Right? If you have one of those, I would look for a different one. All right? One that I, like, I use, the King James one. It's one that you ought to use as well. It's one we use here at First Baptist Church. Someone preaches here. This is the Bible we use. When I was transitioning, someone uh, wondered if I was going to switch Bibles. I did. I had a different one. It was a little bigger one. I didn't like it as much. I got a little thinner one. All right, this is better to preach out of for me. I didn't switch versions, though. He's the King James. It's right. And this verse, 1 John 5, verse 7, ought to be in the Bible. All right, on inspiration of the Holy Ghost, it's there. Look at it again, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That is what we know as the Trinity. Three in one. That's a tremendous truth in God's Word, tremendous truth for your life and for my life, that God, the Father, is God. God the Son is also God. And God the Holy Spirit, which dwells inside of us, is also God. I don't want that verse not in my Bible. I'm sorry. I don't want someone to tell me, well, you know, if you look really closely in an old one, there's one time we found that it wasn't in there. And they'll have a whole slew of reasons. And this is not where I'm at tonight, but I'll tell you right now, all right, none of them hold water. All right, I'll just give you one. They say, well, you know, probably some scribe, overzealous scribe, added it in there. Added it. I want to know his name. I want to know how he went through 5,000 plus manuscripts and changed all of them. I want to know how he went through um, thousands of, of writings from, from church fathers who had this, this in there and changed all those at the same time. He's an amazing man. I want him listed here to work at First Baptist Church. He can they get things done. But it's not valid. Like I said, I'm not there tonight. In case you're wondering what I think about that, all right, this verse in the Bible, I'm glad it's there. But let's go to verse 8 now. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's that word I introduced early on in the series called tautology. All that means is when you say the same things uh, uh, separately, we say the same thing to make sure you get it. See what John says? He that hath the Son hath life. 
And just in case you missed it, he that hath not the Son hath not life. Right? There's no loophole there. It is not fine print. He put it right there, bold. You can't miss it. If you have Jesus Christ, you have life. If you don't have him, there's no chance to have life. There's not a two-way street. It's a one-way street. It's very narrow, Jesus said. Right? There's only one option here. His name is Jesus Christ. He's not a method. He's a master. He's a good master and he's a friend. Verse 13, these things. Have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God? Lord, I thank you for this time that we have. Lord, I thank you for your word, this truth from your word. Lord, help me to communicate these truths clearly. Lord, help me, help me to say those things that would be helpful and challenge us tonight, Lord, and anything that would not uh, further your kingdom, your cause, Lord, would you just strike from my mouth and my mind and my notes here, Lord. Lord, help us to listen and be good soil. Lord, help us to take your word and, and may it work in our life and our heart. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I'm entitled the message tonight, It is Wonderful to Be a Christian. Right? I like the title because I happen to believe the title. It's wonderful to be a Christian. All right, I'm glad to be a Christian. Aren't you glad to be a Christian? Okay, good. I wonder if your sleep's still there, all right? I'm glad to be saved. Are you glad to be saved? If you're not saved here tonight or online with us, thank you for joining us there. I hope before the service is out that you accept Christ as your Savior and you can be what the Bible calls saved. Saved from eternal punishment, saved from separation from God, saved to life with God. I'm glad to be a Christian. It is wonderful to be a Christian. Life, the song says, life has purpose now it never had before because I'm a Christian. I have joy in my life I never had before because I'm a Christian. I have true love in my life because I am a Christian. All right, I have all blessings beyond measure because I am a Christian. It is wonderful to be a Christian. In verse number 13, though, John tells us one of the reasons for 1 John. It says, these things have I written unto you, you see it there in verse 13, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You know that eternal life is a real thing, life in heaven? Everyone is going to live somewhere forever. I'm going to live with God. Some will suffer, suffer separation from God. But eternal life, and that is a life of blessing, is a real thing. This is not all there is to it. And I'm so glad it isn't. I have a whole bunch of toys in my pole barn. As an adult male, the toys get more expensive, more costly, and require more upkeep. And I don't complain. Do we, men? Well, maybe we do a little bit sometimes. And, and I'm glad that there's more to life than the toys that I've accumulated, the tools I've accumulated. The responsibilities I've accumulated. I'm glad there's more to life than that. And, and John says, I want you to know that I've written this to you so that you may know. You're going to meet some people who say, you know what? You can't know that you have eternal life. Oh, yes, I can because my Bible tells me that I can know that. It's the Word of God from the authority of God from the very mouth of God. I know that I have eternal life. I'm going to live forever with Jesus Christ because my Bible tells me I'm going to. It doesn't matter if I feel like I am or not, or whether life seems like it's going that well or not. It doesn't matter. The Bible says it, and that makes it true, whether I believe it or not. One of the purposes, one of the main purposes, I believe, of the book of 1 John, because that's what John says, is so that we as Christians can know that we have eternal life. That means there's a confidence there. A confidence but we like to live life with confidence. There are things that we do with confidence, and there are things we do without confidence. Sometimes, men, you try cooking. Maybe not too much confidence. Sometimes, ladies, you may try to repair something without too much confidence. Now, I cooked this afternoon. Today is my wife's birthday. She is younger than she thought she was. It's a long story. I won't bore you with it now. And today she asked for a special meal, so we cooked that up for her. Had a tremendous time. And hey, you know what? Uh, good time. I got to use my grill. Men, grills are manly things. You get some flame, 
and you turn it as hot as it will go, and you throw meat on it. And what happens? Fire happens. I guess I have a thing with fire. I told you about how my lawnmower caught on fire last week, and, and uh, I happened to have the, the fire extinguisher was still on the grill. One of my sons, I won't tell you which one, but I only have two of them, you can guess, said, Dad, ever since, ever since the lawnmower caught on fire, you sure carry the fire extinguisher around a lot. <laughs> you pray for him. He's going to sleep outside tonight, that little brat. <laughs> some things are done with confidence. Some things are done without confidence. As a Christian, we can live with confidence of eternal life because the Bible says it. I want to work through this a little bit tonight. If we can, I first of all see the basis for this. Verses 6 uh, through 8 talks about how Jesus Christ came by water and by blood. Or we'll say it this way, we have the witness of Jesus Christ. We have the witness of Jesus Christ. Christ came in the flesh, and the Bible says the flesh dwelt among us. He came in obedience and was baptized in Matthew chapter 3. He came to sacrifice, to die on the cross. He came by water, which may refer to his baptism to show an obedience to the Father and showing his um, authentication of his ministry. And he came by blood, which obviously references his death on the cross. The the death of Christ on the cross was the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus was not just hurt on the cross. He died on the cross. The witness of Christ tells us he came by water and by blood. Interesting fact, though, when the spear pierced the side of Jesus... If you remember what ran out of his side, the Bible tells us, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Blood and water. The water there could be signifying his baptism, but I prefer to believe it signifies that he was flesh and he dwelled among us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, truly did come in the flesh and he was man, 100% man and 100% God. He was in all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. See, there's a confidence and a basis for our foundation because Jesus Christ was actually a human. Don't forget that Christ felt emotions and had thoughts like we had, was tempted with those thoughts. All points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. We don't have a high priest, the Bible says, who cannot feel our infirmities. Wake up tomorrow and you have a burden on your heart. You can tell it to Jesus because he has felt that infirmity before. He's felt pain. He's felt heartache. He was there in the garden praying and under such, uh, under, under such grief that the Bible says uh, in the book of Luke that he sweat like great drops of blood. I've been under tremendous stress before, but I've never been under that much stress before. Never have. Not but under, under a lot. I wouldn't begin to say I have more stress or less stress than you do in life. But I can say that Jesus has had more stress than all of us. He was flesh and he dwelt among us, the Bible says. We have the witness of Jesus Christ. He is God and he lives for us. Some will try to deny that. Well, it's just a good man, just a good teacher. It's an interesting book that you have, that Bible. Don't forget the Bible is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. Lou Wallace was a famous general, the literary genius. He lived in the 19th century, and he decided to write a book that would forever destroy what he called the myth of Christianity. He went to write a book to deny and prove that Christianity is just a myth. For two years, it says he studied in the libraries of Europe and America and then began to write his book. But on the second chapter of his book, he found himself on his knees crying out to Jesus Christ in his words, My Lord and my God. The book he was writing, you may have heard of it, the name of it is Ben-Hur. Written by Lou Wallace, a man who didn't believe in Jesus Christ, but then became a believer. Jesus Christ truly did come in the flesh. Some will try to deny, but there's a witness of Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us there's also the witness of the Holy Spirit that bears witness inside of us. So the Bible says that the Spirit of truth will bear the witness. Verse number 6. 
You see, when we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells inside of us and inside of us begins to bear witness. The fact is that at times, Christians can doubt their salvation. At times, we can doubt that we're truly saved. There was a time in my life uh, that, that I doubted my salvation. I was in college. Began to work through what that looked like and what that meant. I've mentioned that here in our discipleship series before. When I taught on that in our discipleship series, after that sermon, I mentioned why people doubt their salvation. I believe that either it's, they're not truly saved, that's why, or there's unconfessed sin in their life, blocks the peace of the Holy Spirit, or some demonic oppression. After that sermon, I received many texts. Seems like a, an unmentioned thing as a Christian could actually doubt and have a thought of doubt about their salvation. John brings us this concept so that we don't have to doubt. So we can have a confidence, so we can move on in our Christian life and begin to live a joyful, abundant Christian life. We have the witness of Jesus Christ. He really came. We also have the witness of the Holy Spirit who really is God, verse number 7, the Trinity, and lives inside of me because I've accepted Christ as my Savior. And though witness of the Holy Spirit bears witness inside reminds us of things called conviction maybe sometime you've said something you shouldn't say and the Holy Spirit has convicted you one time I was speaking about this and and I said you know sometimes the Holy Spirit calls me idiot hey idiot does anybody else get referred to anybody? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, preacher. I'm glad it's someone else. I was preaching this, and a lady came up to me after the service. She goes, I didn't, I didn't appreciate that. She goes, the Holy Spirit doesn't call you idiot. And I said, ma'am, I, I, and I was a little taken back. I, you know, was kind of surprised. I said, well, ma'am, I said, it was just a kind of a point of an illustration, you know, showing that I, I'm stupid sometimes. All right? We, we can all agree on that. Amen? All right? Honey, quiet down. And... Uh, and she goes, well, I grew up in a very abusive household, and, and my father called me lots of names, and my heavenly father doesn't call me any name but a new name written down in glory. I said, ma'am, okay, fair enough. So I walked away, I said, fair enough, but still sometimes I feel like I'm an idiot, and the Holy Spirit gets my attention that way. All right, the fact is he loves us more than we love him. He's wonderful, the witness of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus is real, but our mind, our flesh, the world will tell us he isn't real. The Spirit tells us He's enough, yet everything else around us tells us He's not enough. You can have Jesus, but you're going to need something else. Make sure your 401k is stocked up because in case Jesus fails you, He's not enough. You can, you can come to church, that's fine, but don't let it affect any other part of your life. And there's the basis for our faith here. But then I see the blessing of our faith. Look in verse number 11, if you would, please. Where, the, where John says, and this is the record. This is the record. He says, let me just state this for you plainly. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son of God, hath, or hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God, hath not life. They'll say it this way, without Jesus, no life. With Jesus, no, K-N-O-W, life. Without Jesus, no, N-O, life. With Jesus, K-N-O-W, no life. So you can either no life, have no life, or no life. There are many people who don't have life. See, there's no way to beat the system. There's no other way to heaven. There's no other purpose, no meaning, no true joy, no true life without Jesus Christ. Last night we launched some fireworks at our house. I love fireworks. I love big fireworks. I mentioned that before, Tuesday night. The concussive blast in my chest. I love it all. And yes, Miss Chrissy, I got to feel it in my house because if, I found if you launch the, the firework close enough to yourself, you can feel it, I guess. I want to say, though, about Tuesday night, Brother Ryan did an amazing job launching fireworks here at First Baptist Church. Found out this morning that there are some folks in Bridgeport uh, pulled the parking lot to watch the fireworks from First Baptist Church. All right, we found out about that. What, what a neat blessing for that. But I'm glad, I'm glad life is more than fireworks. Fireworks are neat because you stand there, you, you light them with a, with a torch like I do, and they hiss, boom, and boom, they go, and boom, they make a nice big blast, a nice big color display, and then it's over. Then you feel like, oh, I need to light another one. 
right? And one is nice, but two at the same time would be real nice. If two's nice, three ought to be tremendous. If three's nice, then four will be, boy, but fantastic. How many can you light and still get out of the way? I don't know. I don't know. We lit six, and they went off well. But see, without Jesus Christ, life can feel like fireworks. Go from this explosion to this explosion, and strangely, when it's all done, unfulfilled. Well, Jesus Christ, life can feel like cotton candy. It looks real nice until you have that first taste. Then you remember why you hate this stuff. If you like cotton candy, I expect to see you at the altar tonight praying. God will forgive you. You see, without Jesus Christ, there is not life. I'm not talking about just not eternal life, but even life on earth. Without Jesus Christ, with the Son, there is true life, abundant life, joyful life. It is wonderful to be a Christian. Man, I've got a room full of friends here. I've got friends online right now. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. All right, not because our personalities are the same, but we're different. But it's joyful. It's wonderful. You're running to somebody at the store. Wow, how are you doing? How do you know them? First Baptist Church. Because of Jesus Christ. Man, because of Jesus Christ. I have a wonderful, godly wife and three wonderful children. Because of Jesus Christ, I have a, a purpose now living in life. Without Jesus, there's no life. But with Jesus, I get to know life. Someone said this, life has no meaning. The moment you lose the illusion of being eternal. They said life has no, mo has no meaning the moment you lose the illusion of being eternal. And this is life eternal, Jesus said, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Because of Jesus Christ, there's true joy, there's deep peace, there's perfect contentment, there's satisfying love. Because of Jesus Christ, we have life. Because of Jesus Christ, you and I are more alive than ever. Because of Jesus Christ. So quit living like you're dead. Quit living like you're dead because you ain't dead. You're alive because Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, lives inside of you and lives inside of me. Quit living like you're dead. Smile on your face, a spring in your step, because Jesus Christ is alive. Because of Him, we have life. Sure, sometimes you're going to stumble. Sometimes you may get knocked down by life. Sometimes you may get jacked in the jaw because of life. That's reality. Get those phone calls, Pastor. Pray for this. It's big. But guess what? God is bigger. Guess what? There's still life because God is good and we pray and we love, but Jesus Christ brings true life. It's a blessing of this passage. But I have one more point that I almost missed in my study. In fact, I've never heard a sermon on this, but it's probably not because it's not been preached, just because I haven't heard it. If you would look in verse number 9. I call this last point the basis, the blessing, and now the because. The because. Verse 9 says this, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Here's the because, if I can. Because of Jesus Christ, we ought to live differently. We'll say it this way, if you receive the witness of men, if you believe the weatherman, you can believe Jesus Christ. If you believe Facebook, then you can definitely believe Jesus Christ. If you believe the six o'clock news, then you can believe Jesus. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. We trust people all the time. You're driving down the road, the guy in front of you puts a blinker on and you trust him that he's going to turn. When he doesn't, you're like, what are you doing? Don't you know that's a blinker? When you see a car on the road, you trust that they're going to go the speed limit. And if they don't, what do you say? Gas is on the right. 
We trust people all the time. You go there and you, you go to the store. You look at different items. Well, which one's going to work the best? And you start to look and you trust somebody else's judgment. We trust men all of the time. And John says if you receive the witness of men, if you, if you ever trust a man for anything, the witness of God is even greater. But too often we trust men and doubt God. Oh, we trust what the weatherman, it's going to rain. Oh boy, everybody, boy's packing in. We're going, we're going. And yet God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And we doubt that over here. That because if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. I believe that he is who he claims to be the son of God. I believe that he will reward those who diligently seek him. I believe that he is the beginning and the end of my faith, author and finisher. He knows the beginning from the end, the first from the last. I believe that he will never leave me nor forsake me. I believe he's going to come back again in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, with a shout, the trump of God shall sound. And if I'm alive, I'm going right up there. If I'm dead, I get there first. I believe it. I believe it. Do you? Of course I do, Pastor. Then what are you doing about it? The song we sang, Trust and Obey. You see, if this is true, then everything he says is true. If this is true, everything he says is true. I can bank on it. I can count on it. I can believe it. You see, if this is true, then I know that Jesus created the world's. Scripture tells us Jesus did that. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning, God created. And how did he do it? He spoke. He spoke. Jesus is the Word. In fact, tells us later on in the New Testament that Jesus, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If he created the world, which we believe he did, then maybe, just maybe, he knows how it ought to work. Maybe, just maybe, he understands how it works. Maybe he understands how to make it work for his honor, for his glory. If he created you and me, then maybe, just maybe, he knows what's best for us. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe I can trust his plan because he created you, he created me, and he knew me, he knew you before we were even born. If we did, he said, then we know that God has a plan. He's in control. We know that no matter what, we have eternal life. The best is yet to come. The best days are ahead. The best is just a vapor breath away. The best is better than I can imagine. The best will be far longer than any temporary problem here. You see, if you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If you believe you can make money in the stock market, then you ought to believe you can make money given to God. If I believe the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. This morning I had my devotions and looking there. I don't know why I started me this morning. I was writing down blessings like I normally do for my devotions. I wrote down this blessing. I get to give to God. What does God need from me? What does He need from me? He doesn't need anything from me. He doesn't need anything. He's sufficient all by Himself. He doesn't need me. I need Him. What does He want from me? All of me. He wants all of me. He wants me to give some of my resources to Him, and I get to give to God. Sometimes kids are young. They'll bring things to parents, right? The day I was over here, and some kids brought me some flowers from the field, some clover flowers, some of the young kids playing. They picked them out there, and when they saw that I liked them, they brought me more of them. I don't complain. I love kids. Just a reminder, if I'm talking to you and a child walks up, I will stop talking to you and talk to them. You can ask me, do you like them more than you? Yes, I like the I love kids. Jesus liked kids too, by the way. Suffer little children to come to me and forbid them not. All right, so just so you know, they brought me flowers. What did I do with the flowers? Well, I tossed them on the way. They love bringing them, and I'm glad they could. Jesus doesn't need my money, but I get to give it to him. I get to invest it this morning. That's what I was thinking about this morning. What a blessing to invest with God. I don't know what his return rate is, but it's got to be better than the stock market. It's got to be better than the S&P 500. Right? It's got to be. I know it is. I've been blessed by God already. I have. But who knows what the eternal blessings even look like. The earthly ones are great. They're grand. And that's more than enough reason to give to God. But I can't wait to get to heaven and find out what it really looks like. 
Lord, you took, you're giving me this because I gave you this? That, that's, that's what I get because I did this? I hope you don't stand there that day and say, well, I wish I'd given you more. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. What's the because? Because if I believe God, I ought to live like I do. There ought to be some action to my faith. If I choose to, like our theme says, I believe God, I ought to live that way. See, the witness of men, the witness of men tells me they ought, I ought to treat people a certain way. It's not all bad. But the witness of God tells me exactly how to treat people, to love those who despitefully use me and persecute me, to be good to them, to find the ones who are unlovely, to find the ones who are unloved, who have no place, and to bring those into the fold. The witness of men, but the witness of God is greater. The Bible tells me how to structure my life. The world says, well, seek your own good. Seek yourself and seek your happiness. You need to care about you. Love you. Do good to you. Take some you time. Shut yourself down because, boy, if you're not good with yourself, you can't help anybody else. And there's probably some merit that you probably ought to at some point in your life sleep. You probably ought to. But my Bible says, according to the witness of God, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I, I can't find where it says, uh, but, but seek me, me. I can't find that, but seek you. I can't find it in my Bible. If I receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. You see, John says, you're going to have eternal life, and you can bank on it. Someone said this, we're living in a time when philosophically you can believe anything so long as you do not claim it to be true. As long as you don't say it's true, you can believe whatever you want to believe. The sky is purple. Okay, that's fine. The, sky is, the moon is made up of cheese. Morally, you can practice anything you want as long as you do not claim that it is a better way. We live in that time right now. Oh, you know what you want to do, but just don't say someone else's way is bad or your way is better. And religiously, you can hold to anything so long as you do not bring Jesus Christ into it. Listen, my friend, the world hates Jesus Christ. I happen to love him very much. I happen to want to live, live for him. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, but I hope, I hope my life counts for Jesus Christ. The witness of Jesus Christ, he really came. He really died on the cross. And, and, and he brings life, and, and I can bank on it. I want to live for him. John says we can have life. There was a man who said he was in a college class. I had to do an assignment about a, a descriptive assignment. He decided to demonstrate a pendulum. And how with a pendulum, it will not return to the exact same place. For this particular example, he uh, took a string and attached it to the blackboard. And on this string, he started and swung it. It'll swing back just a fraction, a fraction less than where it started. And gradually swing just a little bit less. A little bit less. He asked the class in this demonstration uh, if they got it. And they said yes. And he asked the teacher. And the teacher uh, said, yes, I get it. And began to come to the front thinking that the, this demonstration was over. The young man said, well, I have one more part to this demonstration. He had attached to the ceiling a long rope with 250 pounds of weight. He had the teacher sit in a chair with his back to a concrete wall. He had the weight right against his nose. And he said, sir, do you believe this? And he said, the teacher with sweat and a very timid voice said, yes. And he let go. He said the rope made a swishing sound through the air. As the rope swung back with 250 pound weight, the teacher could not dive out of the way fast enough. He asked the students, the other students, his fellow students, he said, did the teacher really believe it? And they in unison said, no way. See, Christians, 
We can say we believe all day long. When that rope, that weight drops, it's nothing but faith at that moment. Do we really believe Jesus? If we receive the witness of men, if you believe what you read on your phone, if you believe the news, the witness of God is greater. And I challenge us to say, I believe God. Because of that, you ought to live differently. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, thank you that you are a good God and we can believe you. Lord, help us to be honest. Lord, there may be someone here who's struggling tonight, maybe with their salvation. Lord, maybe struggling in their faith to you. Lord, may they not be ashamed of that. May they just come back to you and you with loving arms will receive us. Lord, may we live differently because of our faith. We would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Maybe you've been claiming to believe God, but your life doesn't show it right now. Maybe there's an issue. Maybe you feel like you've been knocked down. We would say, Pastor, while you spoke, God was speaking to me. Would you pray for me? I need to do business with God tonight. Just slip your hands, slip back down. I'll see it. Amen. 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 Hands all over. Amen. Well, if there's someone here tonight who say, you know, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up, slip it right back down? I'll see it, and I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else. I'd love to pray for you. Maybe you're online tonight, and you don't know that you have a home in heaven. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Oh, would you trust him? In a moment, there'll be a number on the screen. Would you call us? We'd love to open the Bible over the phone or show up and show you how you can know for sure. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know the hearts. Lord, help us to follow you, not just in lip service, but with our life. Lord, bless those who raise their hands. May they do business with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The piano's already playing. Would you stand to your feet? The altar's open. Life is purpose now, never had before. It is wonderful to be a Christian. You respond as God spoke to you.